but I know you're you are going to be busy with other things this weekend other than preparing your taxes, right? Yes. Because we have what on Monday? Midterm. Uh, what are we bringing to the exam? Scantron. Which kind of scantron? The big blue one. And we are going to remember to mark the version number and our student number. So in case you don't know your student number, make sure you've got something that has that number with you. Um, that will make everyone's life much, much easier. Um, clicker questions. Um, yes, we'll have another one in just a second. But before we do that, there are still a few of you who are dutifully clicking. And um, I don't have a connection between your name and your clicker number. Um, so if you don't have clicker stores, please check on D2L and let me know. Um, ASAP how that happens. Not that it's really critical, but um, that way you'll get your scores uploaded as well. So um, are there any questions about exam clickers? Yes. Where would the clicker questions be? Because I registered mine and clicker the grades. Okay, yeah. So on D2L, there should be a column that has clicker things. And if you don't see those, let me know. Um, and just send me, um, all I need is your clicker number and your Odin UD, ID, excuse me, and I can uh, take care of that. I have a question. Is your philosophy similar to a molecular where your exam comes primarily from lectures and not uh, <laughs> okay, so the, the question here again for those of you listening online um, is um, do I have a similar exam philosophy to in that other course that I taught last term? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, the exams, when I put them together, I go through my lecture notes. I do not crack the book at all. Now, if you think about it, um, many of the figures that I have, however, are from the text. And so there are a lot of connections between the two. I see the text as sort of a, an extra reference material, and certainly a lot of the other reference material that I use too. So the links and all of the other paper stuff that's not in the text is definitely fair game. Now, is the exam written? Of course not. I've got also like a whole weekend to write, right? <laughs> so much time. So, so much time, exactly. Um, exactly. And it will, there will be 50 multiple choice questions. That I do know. So, and one single best answer for each of them. And there'll probably be a couple that are really, really bad. I can guarantee that right now. Um, and if they're really, really horrible, then um, everyone will end up getting a point for them. Um, and I also normalize to the highest score, whatever that is. Um, and you guys could be the first ones to get, have somebody have a 50 out of 50 in 15 years of teaching. It's always possible. Okay, so um, the first start for that will be our clicker question for today. Um, which is going to be something that we're going to get 100% on, right? Yeah. So, bacteriophage T3, T3, that's not a typo, has a blank genome, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, positive strand, single-stranded RNA, negative strand, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA. And you do not need to search the web for this. Again, feel free to discuss. Today you can discuss with each other. Monday you're not going to be able to discuss with each other. Or if you do, I better not hear you. Twenty. Be sure to vote. There are more than thirty-eight people here right now. Ten. Vote. 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 Five. Okay. Uh, what do we think? And we'll put it on the main screen here. Um, you can tell me what you think while I'm moving this over. Um, so if, um, if in doubt with any of these things, I would always vote for D because these are the most common viruses that we know of out there as well. Even if you had forgotten 
that I had mentioned that T3 and T7 are extremely closely related to each other. Um, so uh, it is, in fact, D, yes. So um, now that is it for new slides. Um, everything else are stuff that I've used before, as I usually do for my philosophy of courses, as David was asking about here. Um, no, I don't expect you to know French. Um, but the important thing here is really that it's not just the virion. It's the whole replication process. Um, so viruses, and many people do this, many virologists do this, um, they'll mistake the virion for a virus. And the virion is just one part of the virus. If you want to call it a life cycle, replication cycle, however you want to call it. Uh, but that's only one part of it. Uh, the sort of one of the underlying themes that hopefully is coming back many, many times throughout this course is that there's a whole bunch of little spots out there. Um, and yes, the virion is not the whole process in terms of what a virus replication cycle is, but it's one part of that replication cycle. And so if you look at pretty much any environmental sample, there are lots of small things that have nucleic acid in them. And one of the virion definitions is, Stedman's favorite, a bag of nucleic acid. And so that's all that we're seeing here are small bags of nucleic acid as opposed to the big bags of nucleic acid, which are the things like this diatom over here and then the um, bacteria and archaea. As well as really ridiculously large numbers of viruses you know, indicated by the virions, um, the sequence diversity in these nucleic acids that are inside the capsids is also extremely high. Um, 90 plus percent of the sequences that you find in these virions is completely different than any other sequence, which is great because it gives us virologists a ton to do because it's all new. And so we have to try and figure out what a lot of these things are in fact doing. Um, not only that those genes are new, the shapes are new, or at least unique to the virion. Now, no, as far as I know, there's some really distant examples, and I think we talked about tail proteins, somebody a second, I forget, maybe it's one of you, about the differences between pili and, and tail fiber proteins. But for the most part, these, and in fact, tail fiber proteins are probably derived from virion structures. Virions have completely different structures than anything cellular that we've um, really discovered to this point. Um, many of them will talk at ad infinitum, and we probably have already, um, about helical symmetry and our, oh, sorry, helical symmetry over here, and icosahedral symmetry over here, icosahedral symmetry here, but that's by no means the only kind of symmetry that you find. Uh, myxoma and the <clears throat> pox viruses have very different symmetry. Um, I didn't bring my big model, but I've got my small model now of some of our archaeal viruses that also don't have that kind of symmetry either. Um, so that's not just icosahedral or helical symmetry, which reminds me uh, briefly is I had a couple of questions that people have been sending me by email, which again is the best way to reach me, particularly over the weekend. Um, and I'll be posting all those things on D2L, all the questions that I get by email. Um, and one of the questions that came up was, what about the largest virions, most complex particles? Do those have helical or icosahedral forms? When we get to it, finally, the largest virions so far are the Pandora virions and pithovirus virions. Um, they don't have helical or icosahedral or any kind of symmetry. So um, very strange looking virions. Uh, how do you count the number of Viruses, and this is really viruses because we're looking at the whole um, life cycle here. Uh, most of the detection techniques, not just for bacteriophage, but for lots of eukaryotic viruses, is the plaque assay or some variation thereof. And so I wanted to, hopefully a little bit beating the dead horse here too, but <clears throat> what we're looking at here in this image of the Petri plate are these areas where you have had a virus infection take place. 
Um, and it's multiple rounds of virus infection because one round of virus infection with one host, you're never going to be actually able to see at a scale like this. So each of these spots represents multiple rounds of infection, but have just started from one infectious particle or one infectious event. So that's the plaque, and that's why we always talk about PFUs, plaque forming units is that single infection event, um, usually a single particle, although we'll talk about some examples of where you have to have multiple particles to get these uh, a little bit later on. Um, how do you do this? A uh, couple of things. One, of course, you have to have a host that they're going to be able to infect. Um, the second one is you have to make sure that, that host doesn't run away. Uh, and that's all about the auger here and making sure that these bacteria stay where you put them when you infect them with your virus dilution here. And the key with the dilution is that at this stage where you're doing this infection here, it's a very low multiplicity of infection. You have way more host cells than you have infectious units. Because if you had more, then you would see absolutely nothing under this. would be one ginormous plaque. Um, on your plate. So you do this low MLI infection and then basically separate all of the infected cells, each of which is going to produce one of these plaques, from all the other ones. Make sure they don't move because of your top auger and wait for multiple rounds of replication. And basically this is a competition between host growth and an infection process. So host growth is everything that you see here that's not plaque, and multiple rounds of virus infections are plaque. So, yes, everybody happy with plaque assays? Good. You can do them. Some of us know. I know actually can do them. Yeah. Can you repeat what you were saying about the one infection particle? The one infectious particle? And so it's that one infectious particle that I obfuscate as always because there are always exceptions. This is biology. <laughs> um, we'll talk about places for plant viruses. We actually need multiple particles in order to get a productive infection. Um, but for all the ones we've talked about so far, uh, you need one infectious particle in order to start that whole infection process. So per, uh, per little circle or for the whole, the whole assay? So that's per each of these plaques. So each of the plaques represents one PFU, which was that infectious particle that you put in there. Circles of death. Yes, circles of death. They're also a great way of looking at it. In this case, so you also have some cases where they don't, in fact, die. But circles of sickness is another way of looking at it. Yeah, Trevor. Um, I wouldn't say reproduce, I would say replicate. Most of the people talk about replication of viruses rather than reproduction because reproduction has all these other connotations. Yeah. You have a question over here? No, sorry, stretching. Stretching. Good. <laughs> Dave. Um, the plaques look awfully close to um, true circles. Is there an interesting geometry story there and how they're. Oh, so the question is why do plaques look like circles? Um, diffusion. You start it from one point and you're diffusing. So, um, in fact, they're spheres. Um, if you're actually far enough down in the soft layer, you'll actually see it's, it's, it's an image of a sphere. So it's literally from a point, point source, and then going out in a... Then, have they stopped at this point, or does it, they just keep going? So know? again, it's a competition. So it's the competition between virus growth and cell growth. And so at this point, right around one of these plaques, um, there will be virus infection taking place, but there, were, there are so many cells there that you're not going to notice. Okay, other questions on, on plaque assays? Again, this is a really critical aspect of, of doing any, any work with, with viruses. And those of you who listen to this week in virology, um, you know that Vincent Racanel is a huge fan of plaque assays. So um, one of the reasons that plaque assays are so useful is doing these kinds of synchronous infections, also called the one-step growth curve. And that also reminds me that there's a link to the original one-step growth curve papers on D2L if you're interested in going and looking at those. Anything is just linked there and I mentioned it lecture you don't need to read, but it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm in microbiology yeah. about how difficult it is to culture bacteria. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why is it difficult to culture certain viruses because they are, are able to get to a certain bacteria that's not cultured? 
So the, the question here basically is, you know, culture, the whole culture issue. And you know, definitely true microbiology, really hard to cultivate. People always argue 99%, you know, some massive percentage of all the bacteria. Uh, one of the things that, you remember all those spots back at the beginning? Uh, we don't know what most of those little spots actually infect, let alone are able to cultivate whatever they're infecting. And so the actual viruses for which you have a nice plaque assay like this one are pretty few and far between. So there, there clearly are multiple viruses out there. And in fact, um, when George Kaysen comes and gives a guest lecture on the single-stranded DNA viruses from eukaryotes, uh, he'll talk about his virus genome that we have no idea what it infects. So um, it's a classic kind of issue is trying to figure out what is infected by whom. But if you do have a nice partner pair uh, where you have viruses that are infecting a particular host, and in many cases, if we're talking about animal viruses, this is going to be a cell culture system, and so you'll have a particular cell line that you can use. Um, actually, trying to look at a particular liver virus, a hepatitis virus, the whole liver is a lot harder than doing that in one of these kind of plaque assays. Um, so <clears throat> here, the one-step growth curve, this tells you a huge amount about how any particular virus is replicating. Um, and basically, it's because you've done a synchronous infection. All of the cells now, so the complete opposite of the plaque assay, all of the cells are infected at this point. Um, and then you follow the infection of a whole population of cells, but then basically back calculate to say that's what's happening with one particular infection process. Um, so these are the kinds of things that you can see. You basically concentrate here on the black line. So this is your infectious virus. You do a high MOI infection. So MOI, again, is multiplicity of infection, plaque forming units per cell. Um, start here, here at 10. We'll look at the Poisson distribution in just a second. That means that 99.99 something percent of your cells are infected. Um, that then goes down. Um, and that's because all of your virions are releasing their genomes. You also want to get rid of any of the uninfected, I'm sorry, the unbound virions, which are here. That goes down to zero as far as the number of free virions is concerned. PFUs per cell, if people are interested, we can talk about why there's one right here. It's because all the infection cells will give you a plaque. Um, and then some period of time, which is really diagnostic for how long you need to actually make infectious virions here. Um, and in this particular case, they're looking at production of proteins, production of DNA, production of RNA, and then finally production of capsid proteins. After, in this case, about 15 to 20 hours, um, about 18, um, you now start to see the production of these virus particles. This is now between this point and this point here. It doesn't say anything about internal or external, so we just call this the latent phase. Uh, where all of the interesting molecular biology is going on. Um, and again, what we're mostly talking about. And then you have all this production through lysis or some other way that the cell, the cell is producing the virions. And then you get to this final stage up here. And this is, you can back calculate over to here. Actually, not even so much of a calculation. Just draw a line back across the number of PFUs per cell you have here. At the end, that's the number of infectious virions produced by every single infected cell. It's also called the burst size. So you can get, again, lots of information just by looking at one of these one-step growth curves. Again, critical for these one-step growth curves and also for the plaque assays is making sure that you have an appropriate number of Infected cells or uninfected cells, as the case may be, and that comes from the Poisson distribution. Yeah, sorry. Can you mention what T antigens are again? Oh, I will talk a lot more about T antigens later on. Um, has nothing to do with T numbers of bacteria. If you want to know, it's a tumor antigen, but you can ignore that until about three weeks from now. So I just want to confirm the burst size is the number of infectious virions that were produced from your original source of units. No, produced from the, so the burst size is the number of infectious particles produced by one infected cell. Because if you look at this, this is now here, plaque forming units per cell. 
and you're looking at this goes from this goes down to one because you're looking at all of the infected cells here and then this final production the birth size is going to be number of virions produced per infected cell and you also notice here this is big this is a log scale so it's hundreds of virions that are produced by one infected cell um, it's pretty ginormous yeah uh, you said <coughs> Uh, during the latent period, you sort of get rid of the excess virions that haven't infected cells. How is that done in this uh, situation? Okay, how do you get rid? So the basic question is, how do you get rid of the leftover virions? Uh, lots of different ways. Um, there's again depends on your different technique that you're using. Um, dilution is one way. So you just dilute everything that you have, and so you end up with very low numbers. And actually gets to the Poisson distribution in just a second. <laughs> um, or what you can do is literally separate infected cells from virus or centrifugation or something like that. Um, but it is important that you don't have any of these extra infections going on because you want all of the infections to have started at the same time. So that removal of, of extra virions is very important. Uh, but to know how many particles you have associated with any of your given cells, it's a Poisson distribution. And I, if I give you a question like this on an exam, um, I would give you the equation and then give you a couple of numbers, basically a table for any given M or K, what those actual numbers are. So you're not going to need a calculator um, as far as it's concerned. But the important thing here is that if you just have a one-to-one -one mixture of PFUs and cells, you're going to have a whole bunch of uninfected cells just because it's a random distribution. Um, and the same thing is true of if you have twice as many infectious units as you have cells, you're still going to have quite a large number of uninfected cells. It's only after you get to five times as many of your infectious units or 10 times as many that you start to get 99% plus infection which is what you need to do to do one of these one-step growth curves. And no, I'm not going to expect you to derive the equation. Uh, so <clears throat> this is basically taking a look at what's happening inside an individual cell during one of those one-step growth curves. Um, here's our initial infection process. Of course, you've got totally lots and lots of these. Then the genome is released. Um, this is that first step that's happening in your latent phase. Early gene expression, replication of genome, late gene expression, assembly, and exit. And so this, I find, is a great background slide if you want to think about any of the individual virus groups that we've been talking about so far through the class. So in terms of thinking about studying for certain things will be happening on the real tax day. Uh, be great to just have this image, print out a couple of copies of it for each of the individual viruses you're looking at. Go through, mark down some of the proteins that are involved in each of the processes. Think about how each one is going through. Okay, so there was uh, some confusion mentioning D2L. Thanks, Trevor, for pointing this out. Uh, there's a mistake in the textbook. Um, the textbook has the wrong Baltimore classes, the wrong numbers for them. Uh, here, Baltimore class 1 is double-stranded DNA, like bacteriophage T7 and 3, Seven and three yes. Um, so, and again, the vast majority of viruses that we know today are, in fact, these double-stranded um, DNA viruses, which then can be transcribed either by cellular or by viral DNA-dependent RNA polymerases to make your messenger RNA. Um, class 2 are these single-stranded DNA viruses that will... Again, talk considerably more about later on. Um, we already talked about one of these, which is, which one? Single-stranded DNA virus. PHIX-174, exactly. So um, PHIX-174, bacteriophage T7. Where's MS2 Q-beta? Down here, positive strand. RNA virus, which has to make a negative strand. And so this process, um, that's where your viral replicates and all the host proteins come in, um, then make your messenger RNA, and that all gets um, <clears throat> translated into protein. Um, and we'll talk, actually, we're not going to talk anything about any double-stranded RNA viruses 
We'll talk a lot about some negative strand RNA viruses, and then also talk about some of the retroviruses um, a little bit later on. Okay, questions on the Baltimore class. Again, I'm sorry about the confusion in the textbook. I need to write them a nasty gram. Let them know. I, I was wondering last night, looking at their edge cases, are there any, are all the Baltimore classes totally mutually exclusive, or do you have any weird viruses? DNA and RNA. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so, um, no, the reason I'm laughing at, at David's question here is um, when Trev asked me the question about, you know, is this, you know, is the book right? Is, is this not right? Um, what do you do? You go to Google and, you know, look at Google Images. And in fact, in one of the Google Images, is in fact an image from one of my papers, <laughs> uh, where there actually does seem to be some interaction between some of these different genomes, which is very bizarre, and recombination. And George will talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, but as far as we're concerned, there are, we as in Monday morning, um, there are six of them, and these are those six. So, but yes, there are always exceptions. And this is biology. And anytime you've got 10 to the 31 virions, they're going to be exceptions. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I think I didn't do a terribly good job of explaining um, icosahedral symmetry. I so much icosahedral symmetry, but the quasi-equivalence concept. So I wanted to go over that in a little bit more detail. Um, again, the idea here is that, again, gross oversimplification, but smaller is better as far as virions are concerned. Uh, Nucleic acid is really big, proteins are relatively small, and if you can use multiple copies of the same protein or very similar proteins, you're a lot better off. How do you approximate the largest volume with smallest surface area, close to a sphere? That's going to be an icosahedron. And so, you know, main thing here is that we've got in our icosahedron, we've got these five-fold axes of symmetry. You're going to have 12 of them. You're always going to have 12 five-fold axes of symmetry. Um, and that has to do with the calculations that you need to get to T numbers. And if you're interested in that, again, I can give you all kinds of information. Um, but as far as we're concerned, H squared plus HK plus K squared. Um, the other thing here that I'm not sure I did a terribly good job of, of explaining is the 60 capsid subunits. And the reason for that is very simple. Around each five-fold axis of symmetry, you have five proteins. And you've got 12 of these five-fold axes of symmetry. So you've got 60 capsid proteins. So that's hopefully um, relatively straightforward. But again, I think I didn't do a terribly good job of explaining that. You should probably go back and listen to my lectures and see how well I did. Um, <clears throat> but then the thing which, again, I'm pretty sure I didn't do a nice job of explaining is this whole idea of quasi-equivalence. And quasi-equivalence is basically taking that same capsid protein, and that's supposed to be represented here by all of our little commas. So at our five-fold axis of symmetry, which is up here, you would have five of these little commas, all the same protein associated with the five-fold axis of symmetry. And here you can see that much more nicely at our t equals one icosahedron here. Five of these all associated together. And the idea of Casper and Klug, this whole idea of quasi-equivalence, gets you to say, um, is that that five-fold symmetric interaction of all these proteins is similar to, or quasi-equivalent to, six of these all coming together. And so the idea is that this, which we have all six of them coming together, is going to be very similar, not quite the same, as when you have five of them coming together here. Yeah? So quasi-equivalent is using the same subunits but having altered structure for pseudo ecosequential because we have some different proteins that are associated with this. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly correct. So if it's a truly quasi-equivalent structure, it's going to be the same capsid proteins in slightly different arrangements relative to each other. And it's always going to be just um, hexamers and pentamers. Um, set up together, so hexamers 6, panamers 5, all put together um, in this kind of, of fashion. The pseudo-symmetrical um, structures, that's when you have different proteins that are arranged in the same way, but they're not identical proteins. Okay, so whenever there's a P, T equals, that small p, that's going to be pseudo, which means there's going to be multiple different proteins that are involved there. 
Does that make more or less sense? Better explanation now. Uh, another thing that I wanted to emphasize here is that <clears throat> with our t equals 1, again, we've got our five-fold axes of symmetry. Um, 12 of those times 5 is going to be 60. But it turns out that if you add all of these now in the quasi-equivalent structure, um, these hexamers, so six of these capsid proteins together, um, and using this T number calculation, it describes not only the geometry and how they're arranged relative to each other, but also the number of capsid proteins. So if you have a T equals three quasi-equivalent structure, that's going to have how many capsid proteins? 180. So T number times 60. If you have a T equals four, and this is only a partial piece of this one here. I've actually got a t equals 12 up here. People are interested in looking at that later. Uh, so how many capsid protein subunits would there be in a quasi-equivalent t equals 4 icosahedron? Yeah, so 60 times 60 times 60 times 60. So 60 times 4, 240. So, and if you have a t equals 31 quasi-equivalent particle, um, I can't do 31 times 60 in my head. Hopefully somebody else can. Uh, but you can get the number of <clears throat> capsid proteins in this particular structure. Now, it turns out that this is not a completely regular quasi-equivalent because hopefully it's pretty obvious that the five-fold axis, it looks kind of different. And that's these projections here, all the five-fold axis of symmetry. So we don't have this as a purely quasi-equivalent structure, it would be a, what? Pseudo t equals 31. So Stedman should put a p up here. p t equals 31 process. And so if I were to give you a question like, what is the t number of this particular icosahedral symmetric stru structure, um, it would be something like this. I would not give you something like this. So, uh, and everyone's happy counting t numbers on something like this? Yes, no? So in the pseudo-equivalent, yeah. we can't, in the T number, we can't determine the number of capsid proteins because we don't have enough information. Um, right? It really is going to depend. So the question is, you know, from pseudo-quasi-equivalents, um, if they are, in fact, arranged in a quasi-equivalent fashion and you add the two of them together, then you would actually end up with that 60 times number. So in this case, for instance, um, we would, if you had six um, of these... Um, all around back up. Um, six here in this case, um, and these are the major capsid protein, which is here. They are all arranged approximately, and then this is a penton, and there are five that are actually here. You can do those calculations, and you do come up with the correct number. Yeah? Can you do them for this one? Oh, do a t equals 31 here? Yeah, sure. I'll, do my, I'll get my little um, pencil out here and, and try. We shall see. So um, what's the most important thing if you're going to try and calculate this? Five find your five-fold axis of symmetry. So here's a nice one right here at the top. <laughs> OK, so that's our five-fold axis of symmetry. Where's our next one? Here. There's one. OK, so we need to get from this one to that one. And actually, I think the pointer is going to be a little bit easier. So um, start here. We go one in this direction, two, three, four, five, change direction, go one. <laughs> so H is five, T, uh, K is one. Um, 25 plus five plus one. 31. Yes? No? Huh? You're counting into the Yes, so it's always from middle to middle. Middle of pentamer, middle of hexamer, exactly. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's the problem with my big fat thumb here. Yeah? Why is your lemon shaped virus that you have a whole This guy, yes. Why is it um, a lemon instead of a spear fish? Um, 
read the cover article in the Journal of Virology of 2015, <laughs> January 1st. Uh, we have a model for how we think that it fits together and actually is kind of a squished icosahedron. Um, but that's complete hand-waving at this point. Okay. Yeah, We don't know. And, and the other big question is, well, does this make it super stable at extreme environments? Maybe. It would be kind of cool if that were the case. Hopefully, the International Science Foundation is going to give us a lot of money so we can try and figure out that this is true. So that's the plan anyway. We shall see. Call up your congressman. Let them know. It's important stuff. <laughs> um, so so uh, yeah, the, the interesting ones, of course, all the interesting viruses are like this. But there are some uninteresting viruses that have envelopes. No. <laughs> um, a lot of the animal viruses, of course, have envelopes on the outside. Um, and those have virus receptor binding proteins stuck in those membranes. And so here, this is the viral envelope, the viral membrane here. And I'm you know, bad mouthing this, but it actually turns out there's a membrane in these kinds of viruses too. Um, <clears throat> and in most cases, you're going to have large extra virion domains here. These again, this is what's going to be binding to your Receptor molecule on the outside of the cell, very often then a large conformational change in this particular structure, which will allow the viral genome, which is down in here, to escape and get out into the cellular cytoplasm, or in that case, in many cases, also nucleus, um, which is where you need it to be to be replicating. Um, very often. These are highly glycosylated, um, and glycosylated just means that you've got lots of sugar residues on the outside. And when we talk more about some of the other viral proteins, very often you'll see GP, so it'll be a gene product, but also the glycoprotein, or G. So we'll, we'll see Gs quite often in some of the terminology uh, later on in the process. So viral entry, this is everything you need to know about viral entry. Well, at least some of the details. Yeah, Trevor. <coughs> we were saying the other day um, about there's, there's protein binding, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's what we were just saying, um, protein binding to fusion, yeah. right? And, and so are these like two distinctly separate steps of entry? Oh, so the question is about you know, how, how entry is taking place. And I, this is good to actually use this, um, this year as a, an example. So um, first thing that happens is you have interaction between your virus receptor binding protein. And that could be in an envelope. It could also be on the exterior of one of these naked particles as well. Um, so first you have this protein. And then necessarily a protein that's interacting with. It could be uh, a sugar molecule. It could be LPS that we talked about in terms of a lot of the bacteriophage. Um, but that's the first interaction that takes place is that protein ligand interaction. Then if you've got a enveloped virus, there are you know, lots of things that can happen. Um, something like HIV up here at the top, you have fusion that takes place at the plasma membrane. And so, but that's after you've had the interactions of the proteins on the outside of the virion with whatever thing they're interacting with. Uh, same thing is true for something like influenza which comes in through an endosome, and then you have a membrane fusion event that takes place. And, but again here, it's been first thing that happens is the interaction between the hemagglutinin that we've talked about and the sialic acid on the outside of the cell that comes into the endosome. And then there's a conformational change which leads to fusion. Um, same thing is true with herpes viruses here. Um, Adenovirus is a little bit different because it's a naked virus. This is not actually a fusion event that takes place. There are no membranes to fuse. This gets into endosomes and then ends up breaking out of the endosome. And then the virus capsid is then transported to the nucleus. Um, herpes virus, the virus capsid, it turns out is very similar to the virus capsid nanovirus. That gets transported to the nucleus. These two guys are too big, the capsids, for the nucleocapsid, which is on the inside of that envelope, to get through the nuclear membrane. And so the DNA is actually released at that point. There are a number of smaller virions. Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk too much about hepatitis um, B virus, but we'll talk about the parvoviruses and SB40. 
fact that uh, one set growth curve you're asking about, it's back to SP40, <laughs> so that's where these T antigens come from. Um, so these guys come in through SP40, a slightly different process than the rest of them, but these endosomes, and the capsid here is small enough that it actually gets inside the nucleus directly. Now, why inside the nucleus in a lot of these cases? This is obvious for when you've got a retrovirus up here because they've got to insert into the genome and be able to replicate DNA viruses because all the DNA repair, sorry, replication machinery is present in the nucleus. Um, some of the RNA viruses much more so because there's RNA transcription, which is almost all going on in the nucleus as well. Um, so unless you have a just purely RNA dependent RNA polymerase replicating system, you don't need to go into the nucleus, but many of these actually do. Yeah, you had a question. Um, so the uh, changing change, does that only happen in the immunosome, or, or can it happen in, um, when the virus um, cues at the plasma membrane? Okay, so the, the question here, um, sorry to, to paraphrase it here, is, but when is that pH change taking place? pH changes are always taking place in endosomes. So whenever you have an endosome, that's part of the natural process. The normal cellular process is the pH is going to change there. That's not what happens to the plasma membrane. So it's got to be a different mechanism there for getting that conformational change to happen. We'll talk more about that when we talk about HIV when we get there. But yeah, the, the change in pH is just an endosomal um, thing. So anytime you're going into an endosome, so here, for instance, influenza, pH change. Um, here, with adenovirus, pH change. Um, hepatitis B, pH change. Um, and also for the flaviviruses, which are not on here, the dengue, again, same thing, pH change. Yeah, better. You said that the adenovirus and the herpesvirus are very similar in how they have different membranes. Is the herpesvirus also not find the membrane? Because it is not taking out the membrane. How is it? So um, the, the question here really is how do, how, do these, how do these capsids get from the outside of the cell into the end of the, And we'll talk much more about when we talk about the adenovirus and herpes viruses later on. Uh, but basically what happens is these capsids actually get actively transported along microtubules to the nucleus, which is crazy, but it's what happens. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's the process, and that's why I say they're similar in terms of them getting through there. Um, the actual <coughs> structures are quite different of the two. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the individual groups of viruses. Um, life with four proteins are viruses alive. Again, we can argue more about this later. Um, but importantly here are really just a couple of things. Um, first one is that as a RNA... <coughs> virus, which is positive strand. You just have to have the RNA, get that released inside the place wherever you're getting translation taking place. Um, and all you really need is some protein for making more of your genome and for packaging that genome in order to get it out. So you only really need two proteins. You don't actually need four at all. Uh, but in the case of these RNA Bacteriophage, there are in fact four of these, um, probably important for making the infection process a little bit more efficient. Um, the other important aspect about this is particularly true for all of these RNA virus genomes. Um, you've got a coat gene, which you need a whole bunch of copies of in terms of your actual protein. You have an enzyme replicase protein that you need very small amounts of. You've got to regulate the amounts of these, and you have to deal with the problem that your replicase, which is going to be making copies of your RNA genome, and your ribosome, which is going to be trying to translate it, are going to run into each other. And so you have to have ways of, of dealing with that. How does this happen for these particular RNA bacteriophage? It's almost all about regulation of translation, again, not terribly surprising. Um, and that's all being regulated, well not all, but most of it being regulated at the level of changes of secondary structures. So it's the secondary structures in the RNA, which is most important for getting a whole bunch of coat protein, 
a lot less of your replicase protein. And then once you have enough of the coat protein, shutting things down in order that you end up with more and more of your genome and less and less of the coat protein. The only aspect here, which is really not about changes in secondary structure of your RNA, has to do with making the lysis protein. And that's all about the ribosome bouncing back and forth on the RNA at a very low percentage, but a high enough percentage of the time that it can restart translation near the stop codon for the coat protein. So here, stop codon for coat protein, start codon for lysis protein. So this, this regulation doesn't have to do with changes in secondary structure of the RNA. It's just the ribosome um, staying on the RNA. The only other protein we haven't talked about yet, of course, is the maturation protein. This is made at the very <clears throat> five prime end of the viral genome. Um, it can only be made with freshly made uh, viral genomes. And the reason for that is that there are these two, again, alternative secondary structures in your RNA. This one happens right after the RNA is made. If you leave it around for any longer, it ends up with this structure. And so that means that your maturation protein will only be translated from newly made RNA, which is the only time that you actually need your maturation protein. It's right at the end of your whole replication cycle when you're putting that one copy of the maturation protein together with all of your other co-proteins to get out. Yeah? So is it just sort of a random timing thing that these are base pairs itself, or is there some reason why there's a lag and it's not binding Okay, so I guess the, the question here is kind of like one of these why questions in biology, which are just, you know, <laughs> uh, probably, again, this is a huge hand-waving argument, but evolutionarily, um, there were um, some viruses that had this kind of structure and some that had this kind of structure, and the ones that had an intermediate one, because of these different base pairs, because of the genetic changes, these guys did better than those guys. And just having that particular sequence was selected for as being the most efficient way of making these proteins. But again, it brings up these old chicken and egg questions. What did it look like before? You know, did it have a ton of maturation protein? Did it have no maturation protein? You know, these are all kinds of questions that we don't have a good answer to. No, they are there. <laughs> How they got there um, is a matter of speculation. Okay, any more questions on these uh, small RNA phage? Again, they didn't bring my book with me, but uh, any more of that. So then, yes, we talked about the class what kind of viruses? 5X174 has what kind of genome? Single-stranded DNA. So that's a class 2. Pity I didn't bring another clicker question. Oh, well. um, so <clears throat> these release their single-stranded DNA um, inside the E. coli, and we'll talk about that, how that happens in just a second, and we just found out about that literally last couple of years. Um, then this single-stranded DNA has to become double-stranded DNA. Um, that then can be transcribed into RNA, which gets made into proteins, which are important for making your more of your capsid proteins. Um, and also this double-stranded DNA gets replicated a couple of times, and then that double-stranded DNA serves as a template for making a whole bunch more of the single-stranded DNA. Um, the overview here, and again, literally last couple of years, um, of this process uh, really has to do with, now we have our 5174 particle here, interacts with the lipopolysaccharide on the outside of E. coli. Then the H protein, this is again the new stuff, um, undergoes this amazing conformational change, makes a pore all the way through the outer membrane and inner membrane, and then the single-stranded DNA, and uh, we talked about this, I forget, I think it may have been in the recombinant DNA lab. Um, this basically seems to be a diffusional process 
Um, but these teeth here, this is a lamprey teeth, this is what the inside of this uh, H oligomer looks like, are basically preventing that uh, single stranded DNA from going back into uh, <clears throat> the virion. Uh, here you start replication, um, you get then your double stranded DNA, and then this double stranded DNA replicates a couple of times, moves on into transcription and translation of all of the viral proteins, and that's what's shown up here. We have our coat protein forms a nice pentamer. Um, basically, all you need to do is put 12 of these pentamers together in order to get your final virion. Um, but to put these together, you need both internal scaffolding proteins and external scaffolding proteins that give you a procapsid, and procapsids, again, are very common in microbial viruses because somehow you've got to get the DNA package inside them. Once you have the packaging of DNA inside them, then you lose your scaffolding proteins, both your internal scaffolding, because you need space for the DNA, and the external scaffolding, which closes up the holes that the DNA was put into in the first place, and now you have these infectious particles. Again, the thing we haven't talked about here is replication. Replication happens um, through interactions of the cellular primase machinery with the partially double-stranded piece of your DNA genome, um, which we have here. Um, and it does seem it's just one place that you're getting priming as opposed to multiple places that you're getting priming, as we talked about um, last time here. So just one primase, that's a RNA primer which is formed. That RNA primer gets extended by the cellular DNA polymerase, what should be um, clear here is that all of these proteins are cellular proteins. There are no viral proteins involved in this at all, which makes sense because there can't be any viral proteins that are involved with this. So the only thing that gets through that H pore structure is the DNA, and there are no proteins in the virion which are getting inside the cell line. So it's all cellular proteins which are doing this. Once you have double-stranded DNA, of course, that can be transcribed by the cellular transcription machinery, um, and then make proteins, etc. But more importantly, as far as these single-stranded DNA viruses are concerned, is making more of that single-stranded DNA. And so this depends now on the A protein, which is a either endonuclease ligase or topoisomerase. Um, it's not a DNA polymerase at all. What it does is it simply will make a cut in one of the two strands of your double-stranded DNA, again, formed by cellular machinery, and provides a 3'OH that now the cellular DNA polymerase can extend, but the A protein also is now linked to the 5' end of that, where it's made that cut, through this tyrosine residue. And this is why it's very similar to a lot of the topoisomerases. And so the OH on the tyrosine hooks up to the 5' phosphate. Then you have replication around the genome because you have a 3'OH. You have this is just now being removed through the activity of helicase. And it turns out the rep protein, um, also known as the A protein here, rep just stands for A. Uh, that will also have helicase activity separating these two strands, allowing the cellular DNA polymerase to come all the way around here. This is our rolling circle, and it can keep going around here again and again and again. Turns out once it gets to one genome equivalent, the rep protein will re release the tyrosine, which is bound to that 5'OH, allow that 5'OH to form a phosphodiester bond back to the 3' OH, which will give you a single-stranded piece, and then it will go around again and again and again and make multiple copies of this. This is our rolling circle replication process. So any more questions on 5x174 replication? Yeah. So why does it become like a double-stranded uh, plasmid? Why does it not become a double-stranded plasmid when it's making its double-stranded piece again here? Yeah, the rolling circle. 
So when rolling circle is going through here, um, that's that's a really good question because of course you've, you've now made these single stranded pieces which look just like the genome that came in in the first place. Why doesn't the primosome recognize this and make it into double stranded DNA again? Um, in some cases it does and make this double stranded DNA, but you end up accumulating so much of this piece here that the cellular primase machinery just can't keep up. And so you end up with this, the whole process, the whole Phi X174 process, from infection to production of literally hundreds of virions, takes place in about eight minutes. So it goes really, really fast. And it just seems to be just amounts of how much of this you have. Yeah? Are those, um, in the previous slide, are those capsid proteins, do they self-assemble, or is there other machinery that has to stick things together? Okay, so the males are back up to this one. Um, so you mean here, this process? Yeah. Yeah, up, up at the top here. And so, so these, the pentamers, the pentamers of the F protein, which is that major capsid protein that gets decorated on the outside and inside, um, that seems to form pretty spontaneously. You get formation of those pentamers. So when those proteins are being expressed, you find you get five of them. But to get those pentamers to fit together in the icosahedron, that's where you need the scaffolding proteins. Are the scaffolding proteins part of the final structure? Too? No, they're, so by definition, scaffolding proteins are not part of the final structure. So you have to have the scaffolding proteins to put them together. Then you need to get rid of them in order to have your final infectious particle. So that's the whole point of scaffolding proteins. Maybe I didn't do a, a good job of explaining that earlier on. But they're recycled for making new virons. Um, so the, the question is, how, how are these actually being recycled, um, the actual scaffolding proteins? In theory, they could be. In practice, you're making so many of them um, that probably you actually don't reuse them. But again, you could reuse them in theory, but um, they don't get reused in this case. There are some, yeah, we'll talk about some more scaffolding proteins later that actually end up being proteolytically cleaved, so you can't use them again. But in this case, you actually can and does the sure. DNA polymerase when it first starts help pull in the uh, single strand DNA from into the cell? So the question is, so basically it's the same thing going on here as what's going on in T7. That's a little controversial, okay. um, whether that's happening or not. Um, the genomes here are really pretty small. Um, for 5 174 it's only about 5,000 nucleotides, whereas for T7, it's 40,000. And so, and it's also much better understood for T7 what's going on there. Um, so, great introduction to T7. So, um, the big message with T7 is that unlike Phi X174, it's double stranded DNA. Unlike Phi X174, it's not dependent on a whole bunch of host proteins, it's just dependent on a few host proteins very early on in the process, and that very early on in the process is pulling in the genome, at least the first little bit of the genome. Uh, the, I did um, pull up this animation, and hopefully it's actually here, good, and it will run now. Um, this is the animation now of the T7 um, structure. Um, here is the head <coughs> with the core, which you can hopefully see here on the inside. Um, what's not shown here are the tail fibers. Those will show up in just a second here. Uh, that, there they are. Here are all of our tail fibers, the six tail fibers, that most of the time when the virion is floating around outside the cell are not associated. And then you just have one of these Sort of, you know, reaching out and seeing, oh, is there LPS here? Can I find some LPS here? Can I find some LPS here? Um, I'm going to move around and literally walk across the structure of the E. coli cell here. So here's the E. coli cell coming up from the bottom. Of course, this is all a diffusion process, how this is happening. Um, interactions and reversible interactions of each of these individual uh, tail fiber proteins, he's binding there, binding there, and eventually gets to the point where multiple of these tail fiber proteins bind, yeah. and at that point, then you have the core structure which will undergo its conformational change 
and puncture through both the outer membrane, the peptidoglycan, and the inner membrane, releasing that 850 base pairs of DNA, which has the promoter on it, for the cellular polymerase. That'll pull in your 850 bases. <clears throat> and then once that has happened, we'll have the <clears throat> T7 DNA polymerase, or T7, excuse me, um, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which will pull the rest of the genome inside the cell, and then this T7 DNA-dependent RNA polymerase will bind to its own specific promoters. Let's go back here, back a slide. Here we are. Um, <clears throat> do this process. Binds to its own specific promoters and will crank through. This is about two and a half times as fast as the cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Um, and then all of those RNAs end up getting transcribed into first the viral DNA-dependent DNA polymerases, all of the viral proteins, which are basically everything that this you know, virus needs to do. The only thing it really needs cellular proteins for at the beginning is bringing the genome inside the cell. And of course, as is true for all of these viruses, it needs cellular translation in order to um, get all of these proteins. And just as a final part here, again, this is a higher resolution image of not exactly the same one that we were looking at through the tomography process, but here you can also see these tail fiber proteins, again, bound up here against the shell. Here's the unbound form of the virion with all of the DNA inside it, that core protein, then when you have the appropriate interactions, this core protein opens up. You release your genome inside the cell here. That genome replicates, and you do really well on the midterm on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Question? Before you so finish. The protein, does it hook the DNA, and then when it inverts, it pushes it into the cell? Oh, so the question here is how does that first 850 base pairs of DNA actually get inside the cell? Um, in this case, it seems to be because of the pressure that you have of all of this DNA packaged inside here, that first 850 base pairs is just released as soon as you form a hole in this nozzle structure down here. So as soon as that hole is open, then you get that first release of DNA. Okay. 